In the last lecture, we had looked at the condition of France during the late Ancien Regime. Today, we, we see how France moved towards the revolution through what historians have described as different phases of aristocratic, bourgeois, popular and peasant revolutions. We had seen earlier that France under our late Ancien Regime was in a state of crisis. The crisis was multifaceted. It had different dimensions. But what was very crucial was the fiscal problem. When America joined the War of American Independence, it was, in a way, uh, the last straw, as it were. Turgo had earlier said that the first gunshot would drive the treasury into bankruptcy. His warning was not heeded and France, it now seemed, would now have to pay the price. Lefebvre has said that the French Revolution was started and led to victory in its first phase by the aristocracy. Under Louis XIV, French monarchy had not only become absolute, centralized and bureaucratized, but it expected to have brought the nobility into final submission. But in course of the 18th century, the nobility had gradually managed to recover a good part of the lost ground. And a fight with the absolutism of the monarchy was on. Now, they did not have recourse to sword, but they had recourse to traditional institutions like the Parliament, the clerical assemblies, or the provincial estates. And uh, indeed, under Louis XV and under Louis XVI in 1753 or in 1774, the Parliament was often at odds with the monarchy or the monarchical government. Now, the aristocracy could realize that they would have to accept the termination of the fiscal immunity. That is, they would have also to pay taxes. But it would have been very difficult for them to submit without a fight. And uh, this is what they decided to do. When in the mid-1780s, the government realized that there was a great deal of problem uh, with the finances and reforms were imperative, it was seen that the repeated efforts of the ministers uh, and the proposals of reform that they would put forward would encounter the opposition of almost uh, uh, the entire nation. The aristocrats took the lead in this. Necker had started with this. He had to go. He was followed by Calon. And then came Lomeni the Brienne. Calon realized that it would be absolutely imperative to change the fiscal uh, uh, immunity that the aristocrats uh, enjoyed. And he wanted to introduce uh, reforms which would change the structure of taxes. In 1788, it was uh, after Calon had made the proposal and had virtually been defeated, that the first budget was prepared and it was seen that France had an expenditure of 629 million livres and an income of 503 million livres, which left a deficit of 126 million livres or about 20%. Now, how to bridge this gap? It would have been easy if fiscal immunity had been destroyed. In other words, if every Frenchman were to bear the burden of taxes equally, then the budget could be balanced. Now, what Calon was proposing or had proposed in 1786 was not an overhauling of the system, but he simply wanted an extension of government monopoly on salt, uh, tobacco, etc., to, to end uh, taxes like Vatium and to impose a direct land tax on everyone. But the aristocrats did not agree to this. 
Calon then decided to call an assembly of new tables. He felt that by bringing a hand, a, a carefully picked nobles into an assembly, he would be able to get their consent. And uh, what he was proposing again was not an overhauling of the system. He wanted the nobility to agree to some kind of taxes, but he also uh, proposed that there should be a meeting of the provincial estates and the provincial estates would uh, have common, common kind of seating. He also wanted the manorial rights of the clergy to go. This is uh, a proposal to which they did not agree, to which they did not agree. They wanted uh, the old system to continue, the clergy to have its uh, uh, manorial rights intact, the provincial estates to sit uh, separately as they used to do before. And finally, they, they said that the nobles themselves did not have the right to decide on any change in the structure of taxation. Calon then had the st strategy of going to the Parlement. The Parlement also refused and saying that the Parlement did not have the right to impose new taxes. It was seen as an indirect uh, reference to the States General. And therefore, Calon now tried to, uh, faced with this intransigence, summon a royal session of the Parlement. It was known as the Lee de Jussies. Now, this was a royal session in which the king himself presided. The, the Parlement declared that this session was illegal. It was against the law of the land. The king went ahead nevertheless and registered six decrees forcibly arrested two members of the Parlement. It seemed that what had started as a protest would now be transformed into an open defiance on the part of the nobility. Now they openly declared that the Parliament did not have the right to change the taxes, that only the States General had the right to summon, uh, to, to, to change the taxes or to impose new taxes. Defiance also took them onto the streets. Uh, street fighting started in many areas in Franche Comte, in Macone, in, in Provence and, and certain other provinces. In Grenoble happened what has been called the Day of Tiles, that is, the king's government decided to march the army and the people threw tiles on the marching army from rooftops. Now it indicated that when the nobles decided to counter the fiat of the arbitrary and absolute monarchical government, it had the support of the common people, mainly belonging to the third estate. They also tried to open dialogue with the members of the third estate and the upper orders and the most articulate section of the third estate, namely the bourgeoisie, met at uh, the Chateau of Vizil in mid-1788. And after that, the uh, assembly of notables that Calon had earlier called, and rather this assembly together, said that there are certain fundamental laws of the realm which the king or his government cannot uh, flout. What are these fundamental laws? Monarchy is hereditary. Only the states general has the right to impose new taxes. No one can be arbitrarily arrested and imprisoned. The judges cannot be removed and that the rights of the provincial estates are inviolable. Now, when the nobility or the notables, the assembly of the nobles and uh, the bourgeoisie together made this announcement, it seemed that the battle lines were now clearly drawn. The government decided to uh, take 
uh, to, to, to make concession and it was proclaimed that on 1st May 1789 the States General will be summoned. So this was the victory of the aristocracy. After 175 years the absolute monarch had conceded that the States General would be summoned once more. Now the aristocrats had at least proved two points. First, that it was possible to successfully protest against absolute monarchy. Second, they showed to the bourgeoisie the effectiveness of united resistance. As Lefebvre has said, the bourgeoisie learned a very crucial lesson from what has been called the aristocratic revolution. Now, when the states general was summoned, the king also asked uh, his subjects to send in their list of grievances. Now, the, the grievances, the lists came by the hundreds. They were known as the Cahier de Doléances, a list of the grievances. Now, they underlined the problems and the grievances that the people had. For example, the peasants' major grievance was against the manorial rights. The bourgeoisie complained about the lack of opportunities, about lack of civic equality, lack of uh, any other kind of uh, equality, that privilege was a major problem, privilege predicated on birth only. Now this Kaye in a way provided a blueprint to the deputies who would be elected about how they should go about the task of reconstructing French politics and society. But the aristocratic revolution ended with the summoning of the states general. The states general was fixed to be opened on the 1st of May 1789. It was when the States General started its session that the real problem that ultimately led to the revolution of 1789 appeared. The third estate had from the beginning been demanding that the States General should be like a parliament. There should be joint session and voting by head. They had from the beginning been demanding that the number should be doubled, that their number should be at least as uh, many as the combined strength of the first two estates. Obviously, to the upper orders, uh, this was out of the question. They wanted to have separate session and vote per estate. Now, this meant that though representing about 6% of the population, the first two estates, sitting as estates would always prevail over the third estate which represented 96%. Now that was plainly illogical and would have continued the anachronism that Asia regime had become. Uh, the Bur nobility sent a memorandum to the government, Nekar had come back by now, and they said that they would not oppose the liability of paying taxes, but their right to property, their property must not be attacked, their traditional rights must be respected by the government in whatever reform that they proposed. We had earlier referred to the appeal to public opinion. Now, there was in France something like a public opinion. If one looks at 1788 and 1789, uh, between May and September 1788, about 767 pamphlets had been published. In the last four months of the year, there was another 752. In the first four months of 1789, 2,639 new pamphlets were issued by various political clubs, societies and individuals. Now, this interest in the print culture indicated that people were talking and thinking 
about the situation in France and we're talking about the uh, possible contours of change. Now, they all supported the third estate demand of doubling their number and uh, particularly of a joint session and voting per head, which would have given the whiff hand to the third estate and not to the upper two orders. Nicker indeed in December doubled the number of third estate deputies and the bourgeoisie considered this to be their victory. The aristocracy were upset and they protested but to no avail. However, when the estates general opened uh, with an address of the king, there was no indication of a joint session. The king, after his address, left asking the orders to have their separate sessions. A stalemate continued for about a month and it seemed that the bourgeois revolution uh, or even an attempt at bourgeois revolution would have been lost. The king called for a royal session on the 22nd of June. The third estate deputies, however, returned on the 20th of June to find the assembly hall locked. Then they repaired to a nearby tennis court oath to take what is been made immortal by David in his painting of the tennis court oath. The oath was proposed by Mounier and he said that there would be no going away, that the nation would remain united so long as uh, the state's general was not recognized as the National Assembly. On 23rd, a day later, uh, started the royal session. The king again addressed them, outlined proposals of reform, and then asked the estates to have their separate sessions. The members refused to budge. Bailey, who was to become the mayor of Paris later, declared that the assembled nation cannot receive orders. Mirabeau said that the deputies could be dislodged from the hall only at the point of a bayonet. There was now no other way for the king but to accept the fact that the third estate deputies had already on 17th of June declared the states general to be a national assembly. The two other orders were asked to return. There were already a majority of the parish priests inside. About 47 nobles also joined and the states general became the national assembly and it was asked to frame a constitution. But what the bourgeoisie considered to be their victory would have been undone without the popular intervention. The states general had representatives of, of different classes, but the majority were obviously the bourgeois deputies. You know, lawyers, men of different professions, office holders, doctors, they had all been uh, elected there. Even amongst the nobles, there were about one third of the noble deputies were liberal minded. And so far as the first estate was concerned, more than 50% were parish priests who, as we had noted earlier, in their social position, uh, belong to the third estate in reality. Now, among those elected were renegade nobles like Mirabeau or even Lafayette. Mira was elected by the third estate electorate. Among the third estate representatives were men like Mounier, Barnave, Tarje, even uh, Robespierre, who would become uh, much more powerful at a later period of the revolution. Now, when the states general became the National Assembly, the king and his allies in the upper orders had not yet decided what to do. But very soon, the king asked the army to parade the streets of Paris and Versailles. This was seen as a direct affront by the third estate. 
the royal call to violence seemed to have produced a revolutionary mentality. Lefebvre has dis described this mentality very clearly. So the bourgeois revolution which had won when the states general was converted into the national assembly seemed lost when the king decided to have recourse to arms and the army. Let me say that the men mentality of insurrection had two aspects. One was a great hope and the other was a great fear. What was the hope? The hope was the summoning of the states general. When the states general started, they expected reforms to come quickly. When there was difficulties, people became impatient. And this uh, hope was turned into a fear. There were rumors going around that the aristocrats and the monarch were trying to bring in brigands from outside to collaborate with foreign powers to try and destroy the people's initiative. And with this, the expectation also tended to uh, be threatened. The people took to the streets of Paris. People came from the Faubourg and no one, no one really knew what was the signal. And when the army uh, started parading the streets, finally on 14th of July, there was a great assembly and this was the greatest of the journées or revolutionary insurrections that Paris witnessed during this period. Even before that, there had been popular violence. Violence was their response to the king's resort to arms, king's appeal to the army. A monastery at saint Lazar was looted, gun shops were looted. On 14th, they went to the Avalide and looted the arsenal and then they were marching towards the Bastille. There was a rumor that there could be an attack from the fort. So they were all moving towards the Bastille, which was a fort, which was now a prison. But it was not very important as a prisoner. The aim was not to free prisoners, but they were very few. But the problem was that they wanted to uh, take the arms and ammunition stored there. First the crowd went, they wanted to negotiate with the governor Delaunay, but then some people tried to force open the gate. Delaunay took fright, ordered firing, one person was killed and about 73 injured and this really opened the floodgates. Bastille was attacked and it fell. The fall of Bastille had a tremendous impact on uh, the attitude of the people and, and what they did thereafter. The king was obliged to accept this as the revolution. Though there is a curious anecdote which I must uh, mention here. The, the king's diary of that day shows he has written Ria. Ria means nothing. So people thought that how callous this king was when uh, there was a revolution he simply said there was nothing. But historians later found out that it actually referred to his hunt. He went on a hunt that day and found nothing. He was probably totally unaware of what was going around Paris at that time. But nevertheless, Bastille's fall was or had a value as a symbol. Bastille was the emblem of the old regime. The fall of Bastille signified the fall of the Asia regime as well. It also had its impact on the countryside. The peasants particularly had been uh, greatly influenced by rumor. You know, the vagrants were, uh, uh, vagrants used to pass from one village to the other. There was a rumor that these vagrants are nothing but the brigands that the aristocrats had recruited to unleash them on the peasants. So in, in particularly the provinces near France in Eno, uh, France Comte, Provence, Brittany, Hainaut, there were a whole series of peasant uprisings and it was very clear to see that their attack was on the manorial rights. They attacked the manor houses, they destroyed whatever document there had been and in this way the peasant movement or the peasant revolution in the countryside saved the bourgeois revolution. The king now had no option 
but to allow the National Assembly to properly meet, draft a new constitution and decide the fate of France. The king repaired to Versailles and the assembly in its early session between 4th and 11th of August started by ending the seigneurial regime in France. All the old feudal dues that still continued to irritate the peasants as unreasonable and very heavy burdens had been brought to an end. Of course, some of them had to be redeemed, but most had been ended without redemption. As has very aptly been said, 14th of July ended the political regime of the Bourbons, old political regime of the Bourbons. 4th of August, the decrees on the night of 4th August ended the social and administrative base of that regime. France had experienced a revolution which was the product of a conjuncture of forces which we have tried to describe. It went through the stages started by the aristocracy, but finally the aristocracy was to find a common grave, as it were, with the monarchy.